I'm going to be talking about the trouble with human capital theory. And so my presentation is going to have kind of two aspects. And there, these are two aspects that run throughout my research. One is just looking at, at mainstream economics and looking at the problems with it. But then going a step further and trying to come up with a better theory. So I'm going to be looking at um, income and how human capital theory explains income. And I'm going to uh, first give you a little bit of history of the theory, uh, then I'm going to tell you what I think is wrong with it, the flaws, and then I'm going to talk about uh, what I see as a better approach to understanding income. And by no means a complete theory. It's very much a work in progress. So, we'll start with a very uh, simple question. What explains income. Some people earn more than others. It's a fact of life. And the question is why? Why does a CEO usually earn far more than a janitor? And the question that economists, for the most part, have accepted, or the, the answer that economists have accepted, is that, that productivity explains income. So I'm going to be using this arrow notation throughout my talk to mean causation. So this means productivity causes income. Now that's a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that runs throughout mainstream economics. And I'm going to be talking about uh, the flaws in this hypothesis. Now the hypothesis itself is very old. It date, dates back at least to this guy. This is John Bates Clark. And he is one of the founders of neoclassical economics and he basically created the theory of marginal productivity so in 1899 he published a book uh, called the distribution of wealth the theory of wages interest and profits so in this book he lays out the theory of marginal productivity this idea that income uh, is explained by productivity now here's what he says in the preface. He lays it out. It is the purpose of this work to show that the distribution of the income of society is controlled by a natural law, and that this law, if it worked without friction, would give to every agent of production the amount of wealth which that agent creates. So this is the idea behind his theory of marginal productivity, and again, to simplify it, uh, marginal productivity in a competitive market, everybody should earn what they produce. Um, now, <clears throat> to simplify it even more, productivity causes income. So that's the theory of marginal productivity. Now, I think it, there was a problem right from the start. And the problem was that Clark's theory was never really about science. It was actually about politics. If it was about science, he would have looked for evidence for his hypothesis and tried to test his hypothesis. But that's not actually what he did. He just basically tried to prove his hypothesis using mathematics. Now, he lays out the politics right at the beginning of his book, right in the preface. Here's what he says. He's actually concerned with social stability. Clark says, the stability of the social state depends chiefly on the question whether the amount that workers get is what they produce. <clears throat> if it were to appear that workers produce an ample amount and get only part of it, many of them would become revolutionists and all would have the right to do so. So John Bates Clark is um, basically telling you about his politics here. He wants to create a theory of income distribution that claims that there's a natural law in which everybody earns what they produce. And the whole point of this is to convince workers that they earn what they produce so that they won't overthrow the social order. So he was very clear about that, but unfortunately this, this, pol this politics gets lost in, uh, when economists are trained in this theory. So this is in 1899. Clark's purpose basically was to legit legitimize the distribution of income. Now, at the time what that meant was class-based 
income. So Clark's theory, marginal productivity, was interested in the income of social classes. Now there are different ways we can look at classes, but usually in capitalism we're just going to differentiate between capitalists who earn income from property and then workers who income, earn income through wages and salaries. And so there's some division in the, in the pie. Uh, usually our workers earn maybe two-thirds and capitalists earn one-third. Whatever it is, Clark wanted to explain this division in the income pie. So this is a, a class-based income. He was not concerned with individual income. And there's a few reasons for that. The biggest one is that there was just no data at the time. At the turn of the century, there was virtually no data on individual income. Now that would change throughout the 20th century. Now we have tons of data, obviously, with the work of uh, uh, people like Thomas Piketty. Um, but <clears throat> at the time at Cl Clark was writing, there was very little data. So he wasn't concerned with individual income, but that would change. And it would change with something called human capital theory. And what human capital theory did was generalize the neoclassical uh, theory of income, so marginal productivity, it generalized that to individuals, individual workers. And so what they did, uh, and, and so this is probably the most important paper in human capital theory, especially when it comes to income. So it, it took all the way till 1958, so basically 60 years after Clark wrote his theory of marginal productivity, Jacob Mincer, uh, U.S. economist wrote this paper called Investment in Human Capital and Personal Income Distribution. And in it he laid out this idea that human capital explains individual income. Now let's go back and think about the causal chain. So in neoclassical economics there's this idea that capital is productive. So capitalist income, what explains that? Well, capitalists earn capital, machinery, factories, something like that. That capital is inherently productive and that productivity explains their income. So that's capitalists. Well what human capital theory does simply is say that there is an, equ an equivalent form of capital in workers and they call it human capital. So workers don't own property per se but uh, they do have control over their own labor and they have skills, they have knowledge and that knowledge let's say constitutes some form of human capital. And this human capital then makes them more productive and that makes them, the workers earn more income. So again, very simple, the same causal chain as in marginal productivity, but just extended to individual workers. Now, simplified, here's um, Gregory Mankiw in his, uh, probably the, the um, most popular undergraduate economics textbook in economics, he says, when workers are more educated, they produce more. Um, <clears throat> now, and then by virtue of producing more, they earn more money. Now, the trouble with human capital theory. There are big problems when you look under the hood, and I'm going to discuss them in terms of this causal chain. So, we'll start out with human capital. Well, there are two problems with human capital. Capital. The first is if you measure it narrowly in a way that is, is um, objectively measurable, well it turns out that that won't explain income. We'll get to that. The other thing you can do is broaden your definition of human capital so much that it's impossible to measure. And then you have an untestable theory. Now what about productivity? Again productivity has uh, big problems. The first problem is that economists typically measure productivity in terms of income. And I'll show you how this works. When they do that then they're not uh, testing their theory. They're actually uh, invoking a, an accounting definition. So everything becomes circular. And But we can back up and try to measure productivity objectively. And when we do that we find that it doesn't explain income. So I'm going to walk you through these problems. So we'll start with human capital. What is human capital? Well there are many definitions but it actually started out quite narrow. So in his 1958 paper Jacob Mincer defines human capital as years of formal education which leads to a very simple hypothesis that 
years of formal education explains income. Well, that's very easy to test. You just count how many years somebody went to school and uh, see if it explains their income or the differences in income between people. Uh, so, very simple hypothesis, very easy to test. And the problem, though, was right off the bat that this hypothesis was falsified. So here's Jacob Mincer writing about 20 years later, excuse me, <clears throat> admitting that this hypothesis was false. So he writes, simple correlations between earnings and years of schooling are quite weak. Moreover, in multiple regressions, when variables correlated with schooling are added, the regression coefficient of schooling is very small. So basically, Mincer is saying uh, years of education cannot explain income. The correlation is too small, and once you um, add other variables that are correlated with education, the correlation gets even worse. So, one possibility from this is to basically think like uh, Karl Popper and say, well, we've falsified this particular version of human capital theory. We've measured human capital, and it cannot explain differences in income. The other possibility is to adopt what Karl Popper called an auxiliary hypothesis, which in this case meant broadening the theory, broadening the definition of human capital. So that's exactly what uh, human capital theorists did. They said, well, let's broaden the definition of human capital. And so this has gone on basically without end within the field. Um, and I'll just pick one definition. I'll pick on Gregory Mankiw again because he's so popular. This is his definition of human capital in his undergraduate textbook. He says human capital is the accumulation of investments in people. Now that's fine if we're just defining a word. The definition could be anything. But if you actually want to go out and measure human capital in the real world and try to see if it explains income, this is impossibly vague. Almost anything could be an investment in uh, people, so therefore uh, an investment in human capital. Uh, so it really makes the theory untestable. and I, So that's a big problem. <clears throat> now, let's move on to the second part of the causal chain, which is productivity. Human capital is supposed to make you more productive, and that productivity is supposed to make you earn more income. Now, measuring productivity in economics is a, a whole quagmire that extends well beyond marginal productivity, or well beyond human capital theory. Uh, now, this is a hypothesis that productivity explains income. To test this hypothesis, we better be able to measure productivity objectively. But how do we measure productivity? Now this gets to a fundamental problem in economics of dimensions. So let's walk through it. And I'm going to uh, ask you to imagine Alice. Alice is a corn farmer. So every year she produces corn and we're going to measure Alice's productivity. So to do that we would measure the amount of corn she produces and then divide by the amount of time it took her to do that. And I think that would be an objective measure of her, her labor productivity. Now, the problem, though, is that we have to compare different people. We have to compare the productivity of different people. But what if we, they do different things? So imagine Bob is not a corn farmer. Bob plays music. Uh, so he plays some songs. I don't know how you would quantify that output, but we would call it his output. So the question is, how would you compare Alice, who's growing corn, corn to Bob who plays music. Moreover, we need to ask who is more productive, Alice or Bob? Now, this, when I ask this question, I get a bad feeling in my stomach like it's, there's something wrong with this question. Now, here's the problem with it. To compare Alice, Alice's productivity with Bob's productivity, we need to compare corn and music. Now, we could, and to do that, you need to pick a common dimension. That's how comparison, quantitative comparison works. Now, we could do that, but our choice of dimension would be subjective. And differing, different people might choose different dimensions. So that's a big problem. 
We're talking then about subjective measurement. Now, economists say, well, there's no problem. We'll use money as the common dimension. And the reason is uh, that in neoclassical economics, dollar value is supposed to reveal utility. So by producing corn, Alice is actually creating utility for people. And by producing music, Bob is creating utility. And the dollar value of uh, their activity reveals this utility. So that's the common dimension. So let's go forward and let's measure things in dollar value. So we'll define Alice's output in terms of her sales, dollar value of her sales. We'll define Bob's output in terms of the dollar value of his sales. And then we'll uh, compare their productivity. But uh, now wait a minute, there's actually a problem here. Sales is actually Alice's income. She sells her corn, that's her income. And Bob's sales is Bob's income. He sells his musical skills and he gets income. So we were supposed to be explaining or say, uh, testing this idea that productivity explains income. But what we've actually done is measured productivity in terms in, of income. So we're just correlating income with income. Now, let's break it down a little bit more. When we move from individuals to firms, then we start dealing with an accounting definition like this. So firms earn sales. Uh, doesn't matter what they do, somehow they earn sales. That's an income stream. And the firm then splits this income stream, uh, giving some to workers as wages, others to the owners as profits, and then other uh, a part of this income goes to other firms, and we'll call that non-labor costs. Now, this is not particularly interesting. This is just an accounting definition. We've defined it to be true. The left side has to equal the right side here from accounting definitions. So if we correlate sales with wages, it's not very interesting because there's an accounting definition that connects them. Likewise, sales with profits. So we expect these two to be correlated other than under very extreme circumstances. So <clears throat> nothing particularly interesting there. But what economists do is flip this arrow and say, look, output is actually, or sales rather, is actually output. And we'll correlate this output with wages. And if we find a correlation, we'll claim that this is evidence for marginal productivity, the idea that productivity explains income. Well, it does nothing of the sort. That correlation stems from our accounting definition, and all we're doing is correlating two forms of income with one another. Income in terms of sales gets divided into income, say, for workers as wages. So this is what I call a sleight of hand. It's a way to claim to test uh, the theory that productivity explains income without actually testing it. It's a circular test. Now let's move on. How can we actually objectively compare productivity? So to do that we can't um, measure productivity in terms of income because then our test becomes circular. We're supposed to be explaining income. Well here's what I think the restrictions are. We can only compare workers who do the same task. And the reason for that is dimensions. If Alice farm uh, grows corn, we can objectively compare her output to Bob who grows corn. The dimension of analysis is the amount of corn, easy to measure objectively. Um, the problem though is that economists don't tend to do this kind of measurement, which I am calling uh, task specific productivity. And we'll get to the reason shortly. Basically when you do this you find that productivity differences are minuscule and they cannot explain income differences. Uh, so economists have tended not to do this kind of task specific measurement. Uh, but, but psychologists have, particularly this psychologist named uh, John Hunter. So here's a paper. I'm going to use the, the data from this paper and it was called uh, in the 1990s published and called uh, Individual Differences in Output Variability as a Function of Job Complexity. Now I'm just interested in the output variability and what is important is that they went out and measured um, differences in output for workers doing the same job, the same task, 
And when you do that, you, um, you have no problems with dimensions. So what Hunter did is reported um, productivity differences. And what I'm going to do is convert those differences to a Gini index. So for instance, Hunter went out, measured productivity differences among dairy workers. And I'm going to convert that to a Gini index. Uh, and the reason is because the Gini index is a very common measure of income inequality. And we're going to end up comparing this to income. So the Gini index runs from 0 to 1. 0 is perfect equality. 1 is perfect inequality. Uh, and you can see here, this is Hunter's data that I've converted to a Gini index. And this is only three workers, uh, three different jobs. Uh, but just to show you examples, everything is right around 0 0.1. One. So very equal, actually, on the scale of the Gini index. Uh, but what we can do is plot all of Hunter's data across about 60 jobs. And so this is the distribution. This is the distribution of uh, productivity differences between workers. So there's many different jobs here, and within each job, we measure the Gini index of producti productivity differences between workers. Now. The value itself, this distribution, is not particularly interesting. What is interesting is if uh, we compare this to income inequality. Because if productivity differences are going to explain income differences, then uh, income inequality better overlap with this distribution. Uh, then our theory would be plausible. Productivity explains income. So let's go ahead and look at income inequality. And when we do that, uh, we find that there's a big problem. Uh, the two distributions are completely different. So what I've done here is plotted um, income inequality within countries. This is all the data in the World Bank uh, data set. Uh, so the average Gini index is about 0 0.4 compared to the average productivity Gini index of 0 0.1. So the point is there's virtually no overlap um, Meaning, uh, productivity differences, when we measure them objectively, not in terms of income, uh, cannot explain differences in income, income inequality. So that's a big problem for uh, this idea that productivity explains income. So just to recap, human capital theory proposes that Human capital is some stock of skills that makes you more productive and that productivity makes you earn income. But the problem is the whole causal chain falls apart when you look under the hood. <clears throat> if we measure human capital theory restrictively in terms of years of education, it can't explain income. If we broaden our definition, then it becomes impossible to measure. Likewise, productivity has huge problems. Either we measure productivity circularly in terms of income, in which case we do find a strong correlation between income and quote-unquote productivity, but we're actually just measuring a correlation between two types of income. So it's circular. Or we go out and measure productivity differences objectively, in which case uh, they simply cannot explain differences in income. So th this theory, I think, is flawed from the start. So what then, if, if, if the theory is wrong, then what are the alternatives? What explains income? And uh, to preface this, I think we actually need to back up and discard um, more than the theory of human capital itself, but the methodology that led to the theory. And that methodology uh, is often called methodological individualism. Now, it, it's, it's common in many social sciences but particularly in economics. And when it comes to income specifically, methodological individualism is this idea that if we have individual income, we need to explain this individual income in terms of a trait characteristic of the individual. So if a CEO earns a um, hundred times more than a janitor, we need to uh, explain this income difference in terms of some trait of the CEO a a relative to a trait of the janitor. That's methodological individualism. We have to, the explanation has to reside within individuals. And it seems plausible 
at first, um, but there's a big problem. Namely, humans are a social species. And I think the alternative is that uh, we explain income in terms of social traits. Yes, in, uh, income flows to individuals, but it doesn't mean it's caused by traits of the individual. We're a social species, and I think the defining feature uh, of that is that it's our relations to others that matter the most. And I think it's these relations that explain income. Now, to kind of frame this, let's back up from humans uh, and think about something that's a bit simpler. Let's think about chickens. Now, uh, specifically, the egg-laying productivity of chickens. So there was a fascinating experiment done in the 1990s by this guy named William Muir, who's a geneticist. And what he did is he wanted to find out how he could breed more productive hens to increase uh, their output of eggs. And so in his first experiment, he did what I think would be obvious to most people, which is he selected the most productive hens in each generation and he bred them and continued that gener after generation after generation each each time selecting the most productive hen in a group and breeding that hen and you would think you're selecting for productivity and therefore at the end of the experiment these hens would be far more productive than the original chickens but that's actually not what happened this is what happened these are these hens that are, have been bred for productivity and what you can see here is they have no feathers. Well that's because they've been attacking each other, sometimes even killing each other. Uh, so the problem here that Muir discovered is that when you select for productivity you're actually selecting for social dominance. So these hens that were most productive in each group were really just the biggest bullies. They suppressed the productivity of Every other chickens in their uh, group, they ate up all the food, so they were more productive. But when you breed these chickens, you're breeding bully chickens, asocial chickens. And when you finally put them in a group at the end of the experiment, they just try to kill each other. In fact, they produce almost no eggs at all. So this was a complete failure. And what it shows is that although you can measure productivity, uh, the egg-laying productivity of hens, at the level of the individual, it's not an individual trait. Egg-laying productivity is a social trait. Now what really shows this is that in an alternative experiment, um, Muir selected not the individual who was most productive, but he selected the group that was most productive. So he bred the whole group, he repeated this generation after generation. So this is group selection now. And when he did that, he got hens that looked like this. Uh, hens that were far more productive actually. Productivity went way up, but they also didn't try to kill each other. In fact, they were happy living in groups. So what this shows is that uh, when you that productivity is a joint function of the individual, but also the their relation with others. So hens are a uh, chickens rather are social animals so they need to be able to uh, get along in a group and when you select the most productive group you're selecting for sociality and so you get a, chi a breed of chicken that is productive in a group because they're highly social and they get along. To summarize then although you can count the productivity of hens at the level of the individual it's not caused necessarily by traits of the individual. It's a function of the hen in her social environment. This is the quintessential feature of a social trait. Now back to humans. Like chickens, humans are social animals. In fact, we're probably the most social animal. We're certainly the most social mammal and the only other species that rivals our sociality are the social insects like ants and bees. So we are a social fe a species, an ultra-social species, and that's a defining feature um, of humans. And so <clears throat> this has to be, our sociality I think, has to be part of our explanation of income. So it's fascinating that economists have basically 
forgotten that we're a social species. Everything has to be explained in, the, in terms of the asocial properties of individuals. Well, I think that's a huge mistake. Now, problem though is once we start talking about social relations, it's very complex. Our, our social environment is hugely complex. So where should we even start? Well, I think we should start with what I see as a, a quintessential uh, social trait, um, hierarchical rank. Humans form hierarchies ubiquitously. We've done so for probably 10,000 years now. And the main feature of a hierarchy is that there's a rank, that individuals can have a rank within a hierarchy. And this is a social trait. So here's a, a, a very simple hierarchy. And uh, what's important is that we have these connections between individuals. So the lines represent connections, but more than that, it represents a flow of power. So this person at the top commands two subordinates, and power flows down the chain of command. Uh, so position in the hierarchy uh, is not necessarily a function of individual traits. Uh, the king, suppose this is the king up at the top, that maybe they have blonde hair. But their blonde hair um, doesn't necessarily explain their rank within the hierarchy. Uh, so rank is, is a social trait. It um, is relations with others. And in the case of hierarchy, it's power relations. So I actually think rank within a hierarchy is the, probably should be the, the, is the best starting point for a theory of income. So my question that I'm going to ask then is how much does hierarchical rank affect income? So there is some data on this. Um, th this is one of the best papers on the topic and actually one of the first called Hierarchies and Compensation by Baker, Gibbs, and Holmstrom. Uh, they went out and studied an American firm over about 20 years and they, they, they studied the hierarchy within the firm. And the best thing about this study is that they've made the raw data available uh, publicly. So I've gone out and looked at the raw data and analyzed it, and this is what I have found. So on the horizontal axis here, we have hierarchical rank within this firm. Now I'll call it the BGH firm. That's named after the author's initials, so the firm is actually anonymous. So on the horizontal axis here, we have hierarchical rank within the firm. And on the vertical axis, I've plotted relative income. Now, I have normalized it so that, uh, by definition, those in the bottom hierarchical rank, their average income is 1. And then um, we go from there. So you can see that So within each rank, I should say also, there's some dispersion in income. And that's what the box plots show. But what's important here is the trend, a huge upward trend in income with hierarchical rank. And in fact, this, um, this graph somewhat understates the trend because this, the, the vertical axis here is logarithmic. So I've done that so we can see the, the dispersion at the bottom end of the scale. So note here that the, the people in the top rank are earning about uh, 20 times more than the people in the bottom rank. So that's a huge effect. So this is admittedly just one firm, uh, but <clears throat> we can go a little bit further. And immediately when you start talking about hierarchical rank to mainstream economists, they'll, they'll say to me, well, hierarchical rank is just a form of human capital. People at the top are more skilled than people at the bottom. And that's the, the, the human capital is actually what's explaining the returns to hierarchical rank. Well. There are ways that we can test this, and I have tested it, uh, again using the BGH data. So they also report um, variables that are commonly used as a measure of human capital. So I'll use three here. Education, uh, age, so you, you're supposed to get more human capital as you age, and then your experience, years of experience in the form, in the firm. All three of these variables are measurements of human capital. So what I'm showing here are the coefficients of a partial, uh, a multivariate regression. So what that does is basically try to isolate the effect of each um, variable. Now, 
if human capital variables, these ones, could explain returns to hierarchical rank, this would be zero. Uh, the effect of hierarchical rank would collapse to zero because it would be completely explained by the effect of education, age, and firm experience. Well, you can see that the opposite happens. The effect of hierarchical rank on income remains very large. In fact, what it does is reduce the effect of the other three variables. So these measures of human capital, common measures of human capital, cannot explain returns to hierarchical rank in this firm. Now, that's obviously one, just one firm. So we can ask, well, what about society at large? What are the returns to hierarchical rank? In society at large. Now when we ask this question though we're going into uncharted waters because this is something that economists have, have tended not to investigate. But I have tried. I have found the best data that I can get and I'm going to show you the results. Uh, and I'm going to walk through them slowly because there's a lot of data here. So first of all on the vertical axis here I have shown different types of traits. Now some of them are geographic, so grouping people, for instance, by county. Oh, and I got ahead of myself. This is U.S. data. So I'm, I'm comparing uh, the effect on income in, in the United States. So there's geographic traits. Where do you live? How much does that affect income? There's also physical traits, age, uh, sex. I even got, went out and looked for IQ data. I don't know if that's arguably physical or not. And then finally, socioeconomic traits, things like your occupation and education. So these are the traits on the, uh, the vertical axis here. And, and the horizontal axis shows the measured effect on income. So the way I'm measuring this effect uh, is with something called the signal to noise ratio. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm comparing the income differences between the groups to the income differences within the groups. So I'll explain with uh, a simple example. Here, at the bottom here, I'm comparing the effect that working in the public sector has versus working in the private sector. Now in the United States, I think public sector workers, government workers, tend to earn slightly more than the private sector. Um, but to measure the size of this effect, you actually have to compare the income differences between the two groups to the income differences within the group, within the groups. And when you do that, you find that the effect is tiny. So there's huge differences in income within both the government and the private sector, and those completely dwarf the income differences between the groups. So that's the signal to noise ratio here. The signal is the income differences between groups and the noise is the income differences within groups. So as we go to the right here, that's an increasing effect on income. Now I'm not going to talk about um, each different um, uh, trait here. I don't have enough time, but I will focus on what are common measures of human capital. Things like age, uh, things like occupation, uh, your job and things like education, very common measures of your human capital that are supposed to explain income. And these are all uh, completely dwarfed by up here, the returns to hierarchical rank. So let me talk through these returns to hierarchical rank. Um, there is very limited data on how hierarchy how income relates to hierarchical rank. So I've tried to deal with that here. Uh, here, this is a, a model. So I've used the available empirical data to try to infer in the US uh, the income differences between hierarchical ranks. And because it's a model, I've tried to compare it to um, non-modeled data. Now the problem is that I've had to then go to data that's not in the US. So it's not completely comparable to this other data for this other trait. So um, the returns to hierarchical rank for uh, in Mueller uh, is a study of British firms. And uh, returns to hierarchical rank in Hyman is a study, I believe, of Swedish firms. Now, so these are different countries. 
not completely rigorous to compare them to the U.S., but the point is that the returns to hierarchical rank are consistent with one another in that they're all huge. They dwarf uh, the, the effect of any other trait, the, the effect that any other trait has on income. Uh, so that's important. Now, this is not causation. I'm not showing causation here. I'm just doing a statistical analysis. But I think if we find a trait that has an enormous effect on income when compared to other traits, uh, then that should be the starting point for our theory. Now, what explains the returns to hierarchical rank? Well, this is very complex, but if we want to simplify it, at its simplest hierarchy, what you do as you move up ranks, it, the biggest change is that you accumulate subordinates. So you're in some sort of social network, a directed social network, and it's a network of power. If you started at the bottom, in the bottom of a hierarchy, you have no subordinates. As you move up, here in this particular hierarchy, in the second rank, you have two subordinates. And that the number of subordinates tends to grow exponentially as you move up the hierarchy. This guy has six subordinates, 14, and so on. So the important point here is that as you move up the hierarchy, the biggest change is a social change. You are accumulating subordinates who um, listen to you, obey your command. And I think this is why um, uh, hierarchy is so important. You're accumulating power. Now, I'm going to take this concept of subordinates within a hierarchy and define something that I call hierarchical power. And basically, I'm just taking the number of subordinates below any one person and adding the number one. Now, the, the reason I do that is because if we go back to this person at the bottom here, they have no subordinates, but they still have some power. Uh, they have control over themselves. So by adding one here, to the number of subordinates just symbolizes that you always have some degree of control over yourself. So this is my measure of hierarchical power and the question we ask is can it explain income? Uh, so all we have to do then is find some hierarchies and look at the correlation between hierarchical power of individuals and income. So this is something that I have tried to do. This is the result. Uh, on the bottom axis is hierarchical power. Now, note that this is a logarithmic scale, so we're going up here by factors of 10. So at the bottom here are, are people at the bottom of the hierarchy, or sorry, on the left side are people at the bottom of the hierarchy. By definition, they have hierarchical power of 1. And then all the way over here are uh, individuals who have hundreds of thousands of subordinates. So immense hierarchical power. They live at the top of a giant hierarchy. And on the vertical axis here is relative income. And it's measured uh, relative to the bottom rank. So by definition, if you're in the bottom rank, on average, you'll have hierarchical power 1 and income 1. Now, And this is also a logarithmic scale. So there are some people up here who are earning hundreds of thousands of times, sorry, tens of thousands of times, those at the bottom. Now, different sources of data. The red dots here are case studies. So there are now a handful, six or seven, uh, studies of the hierarchy in individual firms. So researchers have managed to get a hold of payroll data. Uh, they generally use promotions to figure out the hierarchy within the firm, and then they can measure how income relates to hierarchical rank. So I've taken that data. Um, uh, converted it into uh, how much hierarchical power individuals have in each rank, and I've plotted then how this hierarchical power relates to income. So that's the red data. The blue data is the U.S. military. So that's publicly available. Uh, the U.S. reports the income of each um, uh, income by rank, and we know the amount, the number of individuals in each rank, so we can construct the hierarchy, and the result is, is this blue uh, trend here. Not identical to the um, case studies, but we wouldn't expect it to be. It doesn't need to be. And then finally, the green here, these are U.S. CEOs. So CEOs of big uh, multinationals or big corporations are required to divulge their earnings. 
that gets reported publicly available and what I've done is used these earnings I plotted it here so CEOs I've assumed uh, sit at the top of their hierarchy which means they control everybody else in the firm so we can use their firm the size of their firm number of employees in the firm um, to measure their hierarchical power so there are CEOs for for instance up here who uh, command Walmart say and they have literally millions of subordinates and then I've measured their relative income uh, I take the CEO pay and I measure it relative to the average in the firm so that's slightly different than the way I've um, measured income for the these other data sources now then I plotted everything together all the data together and drawn a line through it only to show that there's a strong correlation between relative income in a hierarchy uh, and hierarchical power now when I draw a line through something like this I don't mean to suggest that there's some sort of natural law at work there isn't uh, this is a product of our social environment. I'm only doing this to show that this is a very promising way to try to explain income. Uh, there's some reason that within hierarchies, as you accumulate power, you accumulate income. So if I were to uh, uh, build a better theory of income, uh, it would be to start with hierarchies. Uh, so just to recap, um, human capital theory uh, proposes a very simple explanation for income. Individuals have human capital, some stock of skills or knowledge. This makes them more productive, and that productivity makes them earn more income. It's a very simple explanation, and I think politically seductive, because it, it means that a CEO gets to justify their income. They earn their income because they're more productive and they're more productive because the CEO has more human capital than everybody else. Well, uh, that's convenient for the CEO, but not convenient scientifically. In fact, when we look at the specifics of the theory, everything falls apart. Generally, human capital is defined so vaguely that we can't measure it. And if we do measure it specifically in terms of years of education, it doesn't explain income. Same problems with productivity. Almost all measurements of productivity in economics are circular. They measure productivity in terms of income when they're trying to explain income. So this is uh, circular logic. And if we go ahead and, and measure productivity objectively, it can't explain income differences. Now, what's the alternative? Well, um, I think that we should focus on hierarchy. And so this is, I don't mean this, this is a causal chain, but I don't mean this to be some sort of natural law, but I'm using it to kind of guide my thinking. I think we should be focusing on social traits, and I think the most important social trait uh, in modern societies and probably in uh, most civilizations is rank. We have hierarchies, and people can move up and down the hierarchy. So as you do... Um, move up and down the hierarchy what's changing is your power you're accumulating subordinates and I think this goes a long way to explaining income now this is not a, a finished theory and in fact that we have very little evidence about hierarchy and I think this is a problem and it's something that we can fix because if you want a real world theory of income I think we should be studying hierarchy research go out and research hierarchy and there's good news and bad news here. The bad news is that there's very little data on how income relates to hierarchical rank. That's partially because this data tends to be proprietary. It's the, you need the payroll data of a, of a private firm. Well, they don't want to give that data out to uh, researchers. But the bigger problem is sociological, is methodological individualism. So when you research hierarchy, you're researching social traits. And this has not been popular to do in economics. So as a result, very little data. But the good news is that if you want to make a contribution, um, uh, very little work has been done, which means uh, if you have an idea, guaranteed somebody probably hasn't done it before. So 
this is one of the main thrusts of my research is to try to understand more about how income relates to hierarchy and I think it's a promising avenue for a very different theory of um, of income distribution so thank you for listening to my talk and I'm glad to discuss and answer um, questions